yoga is an ancient art i would say not a science an ancient art a form of exercise generally it's considered by many hindus or people who practice yoga that it's a subtle science or it's something very spiritual to us so me vivekananda has been speaking about karma yoga and he has been speaking about raja yoga he spoke about a lot of great old traditions while he of course denounced a lot of indian traditions also like astrology and welcome to this meeting with Sanal Igmaruku i'm shubhi sinha heading the youth wing of rationalist international we are happy to welcome all of you who has been joining and participating in our meetings for so many years now please note that in this session our zoom and clubhouse will go on simultaneously so once we move to the question answer segment we will take up questions from zoom participants as well as the participants from the clubhouse the pattern for the meeting uh, will be as regular where sanal and maruku would be speaking for an hour and then we will limit to questions to around 30 minutes or maybe a bit more so now coming to the topic is yoga a religious ritual the word yoga is derived from the sanskrit root yoj meaning to join or to yog or to unite but some people consider it to be a religious ritual rather than some form of exercise so to begin with my question i would first like to share some incidents um police in the maldives used tear gas and pepper spray to control a crowd of people who disrupted a yoga event organized by the indian high commission or embassy in the capital mail on 21st june this year this happened to be international yoga day the crowd stormed a stadium where more than 150 people including diplomats and government officers were taking part in an event celebrating international day of yoga how would you judge the great claims made by some of yoga practitioners that it provides a perfect health regime to answer all these questions i would like to welcome mr sanal marku with us welcome sir thank you shubhi thank you everybody we are back in the old format of all three different uh, platforms which would uh, certainly reach a lot of people we also we are simultaneously available on some of the websites this time in the malayalam website terali but next time onwards we are available on the rationalist.net website as well now coming to the topic so generally it's considered by many hindus or people who practice yoga that it's a subtle science or it's something very spiritual there is nothing of that sort which is true yoga is an old tradition of india and a lot of people practice that and what we practice or what we see as yoga as practiced by many people is not exactly what was mentioned as yoga in its original text the claims are that it's uh, it's elevating you spiritually in fact it does not there is a claim that it will give you peace of mind there is no proof that it would give you any peace of mind there is a claim that yoga would immunize you from all kind of ailments and pandemics no there is no evidence that proves that it would give any kind of immunization or any kind of protection from any kind of ailment it's also claimed that it elevates you spiritually what is elevation in spirituality is something that is to be defined by the people who speak about spirituality but it does not give anything that is substantial in the general understanding than a light exercise it's a disciplined light exercise 
And any kind of discipline light -like exercise would help you. It would also help you. Beyond that, whatever claims come around yoga is simply superfluous, baseless, and absurd. But is it dangerous to uh, practice yoga? Well, I mean, if you are practicing yoga for some time as a light exercise, it doesn't harm you. But if you don't practice it and suddenly start it at the age of 35 or 40, thinking that that would be one of the best exercises possible, sometimes you can be in trouble because your body is not flexible enough to do all these postures that are known as yoga now. In the original yoga, it was not all these complicated asanas that was mentioned. It was mentioned as an act to get you into absolute detachment from all activities, free from all activities, a complete peace of mind and concentrate on to yourself and being with yourself. That is what was mentioned originally in Patanjali Sutra. There are many yogas, I mean, six major schools of yogas mentioned by Patanjali. But beyond that, the whole idea was keeping you off from all the activities and making you free from action and get you simply free from everything. There is nothing dangerous with that. The best thing that you can do to detach you from all kinds of activities just go and sleep. It's really good because it will relax you. If you cannot sleep, you can just lie down or sit on an easy chair, stretch your legs, and you're comfortable. And that's also detaching you from any activities. Instead, you can sit in certain postures and try to detach you. Also, you can do that. Detaching you from activities is sometimes good, especially when you are stressed, when you have a lot of activities and then you want some relaxation. Well, perfectly, nobody is against such ideas. The ancient idea that we know as yoga was this detachment of activities and concentrate on oneself and sitting in a certain posture. But eventually it has changed. Now there are a lot of yogas. And what all these yogas that are presented to us has nothing to do with the original idea of yoga that it was. So the goal of yoga, as mentioned in three major texts in India, in fact, four major texts would be correct in India, but not straight away connected with Hinduism. You can see traces of yoga in Buddhist tradition, in Jainist tradition, in the then Hinduism, which had a different name at that time, the Vedic religion, you can say, or, or the Sanatan Dharma, you can say whatever it is. I mean, it was known with under different names, mainly three, four schools, the Shakta religion, the Shaiva religion, the Vaishnava religion, and the Tantric religion. Then came another school, which is Vedanta. Then, I mean, Vedanta itself has different schools. It was based on an idea about Advaita or Vishishta Advaita and all these kinds of schools are there. But the collective is what is now known as Hinduism. There was no religion per se Hinduism earlier, but the Sramanika cult that we generally know, which includes the whole esoteric belief that in India that we had, which include what we know as Hinduism, which what we know as Buddhism, or what we know as Jainism, and one more, which is known as the Ajivika faith, which is no more existing, because Ajivikas are no more there in India. They've been a predominant religion along with Buddhism and Jainism. At one time, they believe in fatalism. They believe that everything is fate and nothing we could do to influence that. So therefore, people believe that you don't have to do anything. Therefore, they didn't do much to advance their well-being, advance their life, and uh, eventually they died out. A faith system that is totally depending on your destiny, your whatever is coming to you, you have to take it, you cannot change it. That would not survive, and Ajivakas did not survive. 
Buddhism and Jainism survived, but Buddhism eventually has gone away from India. It's generally believed that there was a power struggle between the then Shaiva and Vaishnavit movement against Buddhism or the uprising of the second phase of Hinduism. It has gone away. But Buddhism found its new land in the present day Japan, in China, in Thailand, in Laos, in Cambodia, and all these places. And it has spread from the southern India towards east and from apparently from northern India to further northeast. So all these traditions had some kind of detachment, some kind of methods which they thought would detach you from the activities and concentrate on yourself. And beyond that, what does this mean? The idea that is connected with yoga are mainly considered six major yogas. And one of the first things that is important in the schools of yoga is known as Raja Yoga. That is what the great Indian scholar Vivekananda has been trying to project. And he has written a book about Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga is something that he thought one should achieve by reaching the higher realms of activity. There are some people speak about Karma Yoga, also coming from the Patanjali school. If one is active in something, that's Karma Yoga. And there is something that's called as Jnana Yoga. If one is pursuing wisdom and knowledge, that's called uh, Jnana Yoga. Then, of course, I mean, one speaks about Samkhya Yoga and all this kind of stuff is there. But that's nothing to do with what we know as the asanas and the postures that we do. That comes in Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga speaks about your different postures of your body, which you can primarily uh, use to detach from activities and completely remaining motionless. That was the key of it. But what we now know as yoga is something different, as you all know, there are very serious acrobatics that are presented as yogas or asanas. Generally, there are 84 of them that are popular. But when did this come? Is it religious at all? That's the primary thing. You know, Shubhi has been quoting a report from Maldives. That's in connection with the International Yoga Day in Maldives. As you know, June 21st is considered to be the International Yoga Day. It's not only considered, the United Nations has approved that as the International Yoga Day. So all over the world, Indian missions, Indian embassies promote to organize the uh, International Yoga Day. And they would uh, try to involve a lot of people who are practitioners of yoga or other people, and they try to do it. It's a kind of promotion of India or India's image. This comes on a special day, the Summer Soul Stage Day. June 21st is a day where sun in the northern hemisphere has the largest exposure to the world. So in the northern part of the uh, Europe, for example, in uh, Scandinavia, including Finland, where I am, that's a day when sun does not set. And then comes the days with the shorter days, which goes and goes until 22nd of December or something like that, when you have the winter solstice where the darkness swallows the whole day and uh, you have the longest night. This is the longest day. So this is why this particular day was taken because many people considered, especially those people who believe that all these constellations and stars and I mean, these movements and uh, equinoxes have a lot of relevance to our life, they consider this is an auspicious of holy day. And this was taken as the International Yoga Day. There is nothing that connects this particular day with yoga. But how did it become the International Yoga Day? It's very simple. Many people think that, well, when the International Yoga Day is accepted by United Nations, that makes a big sanction of its uh, scientific position. But who said yoga is scientific? I think nobody has claimed that yoga is scientific except some quarks. Yoga is an exercise pattern, a lighter exercise, which has a long tradition. It doesn't do anything that many of its practitioners would claim. But it's an Indian tradition of exercise. 
But we have people who are claiming a lot of other things. That's why they try to give a scientific tag on it. There are gurus who claim that yoga would immunize you from all kind of pandemics or immunize you from any kind of uh, illnesses, any kind of infection. You can be protected by yoga. I, I've heard people speaking that come and do yoga and all the lifestyle ailments will go. If you have diabetics, do yoga. If you have arthritis, go and do yoga. If you have obesity, go and do yoga. I mean, if you have uh, stress, go and do yoga. It's, like, it's, a, it's a kind of a magic solution for a lot of things. Anything you ask, the yoga practitioners would say, yoga will give it. But will yoga um, give anything like protection from ailments? Nothing of that sort is claimed in the International Yoga Day. International Yoga Day is accepted because India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, when he addressed United Nations, first time as the Prime Minister, he proposed this as a day. India is a large country, the biggest democracy with a huge population, and India is respected worldwide. So this kind of a proposal was accepted almost unanimously. I don't think there was any objection about this. So this day was accepted by United Nations as a, a day for yoga. But also this day is some other day. It's an international day of solstice. Solstice is the day when sun is, uh, has the largest exposure in northern um, hemisphere during uh, this 21st of June or the darkest day in the southern hemisphere. I mean, there are hundreds of uh, UN days. There is a UN day for logic, which we consider a day for rationalism. Some years back, I mean, it was accepted logic, international day for logic. So everywhere, I mean, the rationalists are celebrating that's the rationalist day because logic is the basis for rational thought. So there is an international day for practically for rationalism. There is an international day for solstice. There is an international day for peace. There is an international day for tolerance. There is an international day for what not. Anything that you know that can be projected, there's an international day because people want to celebrate something. They're trying to celebrate something unconventional, which brings accommodativeness to all major ideas. So yoga day is accepted, but with one condition. United Nations would not finance it. Well, if India wants it, I mean, if all other countries, member countries agree, there can be a yoga day, but no fund from United Nations will be sanctioned for that. That's to be done independently. With that condition, the International Yoga Day was sanctioned. I mean, nothing against that. Yoga is an ancient art, I would say, not a science, an ancient art, a form of exercise, which has a lot of other claims, like many other, I mean, exercises also make very strange claims, nothing beyond that. But uh, it does not give any kind of scientific stamp on yoga. Or it does not give any scientific uh, sanction for the kind of spirituality some people try to impose upon yoga. Or does not give any sanction for any faith or spirituality also by United Nations, nothing of that sort. It's a day which India asked and it was granted on the basis of Indian Prime Minister's request. Nothing more than that and nothing less than that. I'm not against International Yoga Day. It can be practiced, it can be celebrated like any other thing one can celebrate, it's an old tradition. But the whole problem is, the moment you say that you can cure ailments with yoga, there is something very serious about that. If you have diabetes, that's one major campaign that's going on in India by many yogis. Do yoga and you'll be protected from diabetes. No, you won't be protected from diabetes. That'd be a mistake. And you can damage your kidneys and eyesight and uh, other internal organs if you do not protect you from the high glucose level. Once your pancreas stops functioning, I mean, in initial stages by active physical exercises, not by yoga. Yoga is not an active physical exercise. It's a stretching exercise. 
But uh, if you have diabetes, what you have to do is active physical exercises, aerobic exercises, which should pump more blood in your body or, or walking a lot to burn your calories. Except Surya Namaskar, there is nothing that is coming under the frame of yoga, which would be that kind of a stretching. And Surya, Surya Namaskar was not part of the original yoga. That was added much later. That is Surya Namaskar is a worship of sun in a different exercisal posture. And it looks like an almost uh, full exercise. And one can say that it's a good exercise. In that case, if you take that as an exercise, a Muslim can claim that namaz is also a good exercise. Five times a day, you do all this bending of your body and that can be an exercise also. That's not why people practice namaz and that's why not people practice Surya Namaskar. It has a different meaning. Surya Namaskar is, I mean, uh, I mean, saluting sun or it's part of sun worship, which is no more, by the way, existing in India. It was part of an old belief. Everywhere in the world, people used to worship sun. In Persia, in Babylon, in Egypt, in Assyria, everywhere people used to worship sun. Even in Northern Europe, I mean, I mean, sun was worshipped because sun was identified as the source of energy, as the source of heat, as the source of living. So sun was worshipped by all ancient societies and worshipping sun or Surya Namaskar is part of a faith system. It can have an exercise like namaz of Muslims. But beyond that, don't think too much about all these exercise benefits that one would get from yoga. Who would normally go for yoga? If you have watched in the Western world, I'm not speaking about India where it is now promoted officially. In the Western world, when people, especially women who reach the middle age, suddenly feel that they have to do some exercise and keep fit. And they go for, they were, some people would prefer lighter exercise. It would not be stress that, them too much. Not much body movement, but uh, turn or twist your body in certain directions. And that it's a feel good exercise. Many people go for that. I'm perfectly okay with that. I would say that if people do any kind of exercise against not doing any exercise, even if it's a light exercise like yoga or sitting in a different posture, it's perfectly fine. Any kind of exercise for people who do not move their body would be simply good. So yoga is simply good. And if you start doing yoga in your early age, maybe you can make your body very flexible. But I mean, that does not mean that everybody wants to make their body very flexible. I've studied Kathakali in my younger age, and I wanted to make my body very flexible because Kathakali needs a lot of flexibility in your body. And I've been asked my, by my Kathakali teacher to do some yoga exercises to make my body flexible, which I've done. Clearly understanding that, I mean, it has nothing to do with any religion, but it's purely a, a process of making your body flexible. Yes, that is important for some people, that's good for some people, may not be that good for some other people. But if, you are no, if your body is not that flexible, if your junctions are not moving that efficiently, then suddenly at middle age, if you go and start doing all these stressing exercises, for example, if you have cervical spondylosis, that can aggravate. Some of the postures are dangerous, like shirshasana, that's you know, putting your head down and legs up. If you start such things at a later age, especially, there can be a lot of pressure on your neck, which can be dangerous because your muscles are weak after a certain age, or a lot of blood pressure coming to your head because of the different position that you have, and that cannot be very positive. But there are people who are even rationalists who used to promote uh, these kind of postures, like Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, he was a great fan of yoga. He used to get up every day morning and do some exercises, mainly yoga exercises. And I remember in my childhood seeing Nehru's photographs in Shirshasana, uh, where head down and legs up. He was very proud in promoting such ideas. Well, I mean, as an exercise, if one practiced such things, it may not be very dangerous, but there are articles that show New York Times has published an article which says that some of the exercises can be very dangerous if you are not trained to that. 
for example, may not be four people from India. You know why that difference? The way people sit makes a very big difference. From your childhood in India, people sit in different positions that are not very familiar to people in the Western world. People sit on the earth and they bend their legs and sit there. And all these different postures of sitting are very popular in India. And that may be easy for people when they do some, uh, I mean, asanas or, or yoga postures uh, as prescribed by the, the text. But if somebody who have been all the time sitting on a chair or a bench, later, if he's asked to sit on Patmasana, that is, uh, Patmasana is an is a asana, asana is a posture, like a lotus, you cross your legs in, in a very straight way and put your arms on both your legs. And if you, and you have to straighten your back so sternly, which I can do easily. But if I ask any of my colleagues in Europe, they may not be able to do it. I know one of my friends who has done this for a long time and got his back bad. Matti Antila, very famous photographer. I mean, who lives in Finland. He's a Finnish guy. I mean, he was a very famous photographer. At his young age, he wanted to seek Nirvana, like many other Westerners who go to the Orient to seek the, 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 the mighty feelings that the Eastern tradition or Oriental tradition would give them. He has gone to India and Sri Lanka to become a monk. He was in his early 20s. Now he's in his 70s, I think. I mean, he told me many times this story. He has gone to India, but he was not happy. Then he has gone to Sri Lanka and he found a, a, a Buddhist monk and became the first Finnish Buddhist monk and went to a cave and started a yogic posture, yoga posture, sitting in Patmasana for a long time. By the way, it's, it's part of Buddhist tradition also. It's not have nothing to do with Hinduism. It's an old tradition that comes from India, which is spread in Sri Lanka also, also in Nepal. And he sat several days in that posture, only for, I mean, the toilets or some food he would get up from that position, or once in a week he would go to the nearby shop. He tried to be in that position for a long, long, long time, like many people in uh, Kumbh Mela, the great festival of, uh, uh, in, in the banks of Ganges that you see, I mean, periodically. I mean, there are many people who do all these kind of different postures for a long time. It's generally set in the ancient uh, uh, Puranas or the ancient books of India that people attain great powers by sitting idle for a long time, concentrating. They call it tapas, sitting on a lotus position or a different position for a long time without any body movement. Again, remember, without any body movement, that's the key of yoga for a long time, you would gain a lot of power. That was the ancient belief. And the gods were very afraid and angry. Sometimes the gods, gods, god of gods at that time, Indra, would be so angry that he would send some divine dances from his palace to these people to divert them from their concentration with yoga. There are a lot of stories like that. So the Menaka was once sent to I mean, uh, stop the, the, the yoga or meditation of one guy. And I mean, well, I mean, he was absolutely fascinated by this lady. And I mean, he, she got pregnant. And of course, they were happy because he would not gain power. That was the belief at that time. One would gain power. That's the key of the whole thing. The Buddhist tradition, Jainist tradition, and the ancient, the Sanatana tradition believed in attaining power by detaching from action, no action, sit idle and concentrate on yourself, look into yourself and or think nothing. And if you sit like that in a certain posture for a long time, you're going to gain a lot of power. In fact, you don't gain any power, but you may get some comfort in the beginning, but after some time, you get into a kind of trance, which would make you weaker. Keep away from reality. You would need only less food after that time because your body is not moving. All these beliefs are there in all traditions in India you can have. But that confuses people now. A lot of people take all these ancient texts very seriously, especially the stories in Puranas, which are fascinating stories of mythology, nothing more than that. 
But in every myth, you find something in connection with this yogic postage that give you great powers. It's, it's fascinating like the Greek mythology or the Babylonian mythology. Indian mythology is full and rich. But when you come to ground realities, if you follow all these traditions, you cannot reach anywhere. You have to come to contemporary reality of understanding of our own body in the modern context. Perhaps in the old times, when people have been walking a lot and doing a lot of things for their daily life, their hundreds and gatherers, and those people who sat for their comfort for some time was respected, that was probably promoted. But also it has to be remembered that not everybody was following yoga, but those people who were supposed to be the holy people, or people who wanted to be esoteric, they were doing yoga. But yoga got a big lift in 19th century. Till then, we don't hear much about yoga. Swami Vivekananda has been speaking about Karma Yoga and he has been speaking about Raja Yoga. He spoke about a lot of great old traditions, while he, of course, denounced a lot of Indian tradition also, like astrology. Again, it's an Indian tradition, a pseudoscience. But uh, Vivekananda was courageous enough to denounce astrology. He once said also, if, star, if somebody says that stars would decide my destiny, I would ask the stars to go away. That was, I mean, not the exact sentence. I mean, that is the kind of words he used against astrology. But coming beyond that, he defended uh, yoga and presented it as a great tradition of India that gave a kind of a new sanction to yoga. Also, you have to understand that this was the time when a lot of Western people started looking to East for magic and Oriental esoteric experience. People like Madame Blavatsky came to India and spoke about great magical powers that one could attain. Or Annie Besant, once a great free thinker and associate of Charles Bradla, when she came to India and was influence of was under the influence of Madame Blavatsky, and I mean she started later the Theosophical Society was believing in a lot of superstitious structures later, especially the magical powers of the traditional Oriental thought. I would say that has nothing to do with reality. People like to believe in great things. The great travelers in sea would like to believe that they have seen great monsters. Everybody would like to tell wonderful stories. I mean, India, for example, was presented at a time, was a land of uh, flying fuckies who are moving here and there on carpets or levitate on the air and move without touching the air. All these kind of fascinating stories. I've, even now I hear from people who never visited India asking whether actually these yogis would levitate and go or, or are there real yogis who fly on carpets? There are fascinating stories about India. Therefore, there is a lot of fascination about an easy exercise from India. You can see a lot of yoga studios, especially in urban cities in the United States or in many European cities also you can see. And all these places, the, the people who go there are mainly middle-aged women who you can see the kind of people. They are trying to look for an easy exercise. And they don't actually think about all these magical claims that people make. But sometimes, you know, kind of the India feeling, like the Indian chai or the agarbattis or the yoga and all are connected with the Indian experience for a lot of people. But beyond that, if you want to present this as something that can cure you from ailments, and if it is presented that the best exercise possible, and if somebody wants to say that it's scientific, that that's the best way to protect you from ailments or giving you all the absolute perfect health, that's an extraordinary claim which has no base. I mean, I would like to assert that yoga is nothing dangerous in the normal sense. If you don't have, for example, any kind of uh, problems in connection with uh, cervical spondylosis or if you don't have a bad disc or anything, you can practice some yoga. There is no problem. It's a light exercise. But 
don't think that that's the best exercise in modern times. Because if you look at the demographically, I mean, if you look at the health issues in the world, those people who go for yoga are mainly from the Western world or in the urban cities. There, the major problem is obesity, lack of body movement. People are sitting and not really moving their body. That's one of the major problems. So what kind of exercise you need then? You need to move your body. You want to walk. You should walk and run. And you should do physical exercises. And you should have aerobic exercises. That's what is advised to a modern man because he is not actually moving his body to the extent that it is actually required. You have to burn your calories. You have to get your blood pumped. For that, you need aerobic exercises or running or frisk walking. Recently, I mean, one uh, yoga journal in uh, Scandinavia, Ananda, has interviewed me. That was published in Finnish and Swedish and English. That's on my website also, you can see. I've told them that I have done yoga. I mean, I'm, I have nothing against that as a child. I mean, young man, I've done yoga. But uh, then they asked, what is the yoga asana that you would prefer now? What kind of yoga? I said, if you ask me what I would prefer, I would prefer to walk in the woods, in the forest on the seaside. That's the best thing for me as an exercise. Not any kind of yoga. Because I know what is yoga and I've practiced what is yoga and I've seen what is yoga and I've studied what is yoga. And it's not a good exercise if one wants to have a frisk walk and get your blood pumped. Well, that was a very uh, friendly answer to them, but very strictly explaining my position also. But coming to the modern times of yoga. Who, I mean, if you go to the, the yoga classes in a school in India, there are optional classes for yoga or some, some schools, compulsory classes for yoga in many schools. And what are they teaching? They're teaching a lot of exercises or body postures. I mean, which are, you, if you see what kind of body postures that they make, and if you see what were the original body postures as Patanjali, Sutra would say, this has nothing to do with that. These are modern day acrobatics. You do something very exciting to make your body flexible. You bend like a circle. I mean, you do a lot of things. And every day, somebody would invent a new yoga. For example, I've, uh, sometime back, I have uh, read an article after interviewing the, the yoga guru of India, um, this uh, gentleman, I mean, who runs the Patanjali series, he has been suggesting a yoga which is known as the bicycle yoga. One lies down, raise the legs, and roll the legs like a bicycle. And that is nothing, no, you cannot see such a thing in Patanjali Sutra or written in times when there was no bicycle. That's the bicycle yoga. This is a, a Ramdev, I mean, Baba Ramdev I was mentioning about. Ramdev is an expert of yoga for many Indians. He has a television channels for himself and he is appearing on televisions many times a day, one can see. And he suggests a lot of things as his special yoga. He would suck his stomach and it's scary. I mean, it goes completely in and out. Well, I mean, if one can do that, it's wonderful. But what is there with yoga, no one would understand. And another uh, yoga of frisking hands, I mean, he has invented. And I mean, this I heard him speaking on a television himself. And that's very simple. You have to close your fists together and rub your uh, fingers together against each other. And if you do it a certain time, that's a kind of special yoga that would help you not getting gray. People believe such things. And I've seen when I was in India, when I was traveling in metro, middle-aged people sitting in the, in, the, in the metro and rubbing their fingers, thinking that that's a special yoga that, can they, that they can do while traveling on a metro, and that will help them not gray. People believe such things. And people have a very strange, you know, vulnerability. Even this Baba Ramdev, sometimes he made very strange claims. Recently, when the pandemic began, he claimed that uh, his yoga would protect people from 
getting the pandemic. You would not be infected. Later, of course, he has corrected it. He even claimed that he has a special medicine to protect people from pandemic. Of course, again, later, he has corrected um, when there is official pressure upon him. But uh, what these people do, are they really yoga? Or these are new innovations that people keep on finding and expanding with uh, their idea about yoga. To answer that, one has to go a little bit to the history of the modern day yoga. The, these kind of yogas, which has 84 postures, 84 asanas, is known as the Iyengar yoga. That's a person, Iyengar is a very famous person coming from Southern India. Uh, and he has uh, developed a kind of a BKS Iyengar, is his name. BKS Iyengar uh, was uh, very efficiently traveling across the world and making a lot of yoga studios and promoted different postures as yoga to the Western world. Easy exercises, comfortable exercises, and a kind of a feel-good atmosphere he would create. It was not presented like anything esoteric or spiritual or anything. It's a light exercise. Then he said that it's blending your spirit and your soul and all these kind of things, your mind and your body and all these kind of strange languages that you can use to scare people or influence people, whatever it is. But uh, this Iyengar yoga has spread everywhere in Western Europe and in Northern America. And then you have a lot of yoga schools or yoga schools or yoga schools, some different names it has, but these all are practicing Iyengar yoga. These are the body postures, 84, which has now expanded to 306 and every, every year they develop new postures. And uh, these are known as the yogas, yoga postures now. Nothing to do with the original idea of yoga with Patanjali has written. Now, how did he get all these wonderful ideas? He was a great marketeer and he promoted this and he made very successful yoga centers in different places, yoga studios, they called. And I mean, it was franchised and it was very well established, marketed so well. And uh, there is a kind of uh, feel good atmosphere created. They would give you great Indian chai. Agarbati is burned there, then sometimes there's some little bell made and you are asked to sit in an atmosphere with uh, all kind of Indian things and I mean you do support yoga and you feel you have got a great experience. People, I mean, in uh, the oriental experience is something some people like to have a change. So now, from where did Iyengar get this whole thing? Then going back to what Iyengar was speaking, so he says yoga had a, uh, I mean, new tradition. It has been presented as a, something very special from the Eastern tradition. He blended it with the ideas of Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism, independent to get uh, free from all mundane sufferings. Well, you do something and you forget about things. If there is a suffering that you have, out of any kind of real issues. The suffering will never go. You can forget the suffering. If you have something is worrying you, you get occupied with something and you can easily forget it. The suffering will not go. You have to address the suffering. That's how we should teach people. You have to face the problem. You have to address it. Not running away from that, not forgetting about it, and thinking that you have escaped out of it. That's precisely what all these esoteric experiences that these people try to provide would give. They would also give meditation sessions. Most of the studios are multifaceted things. I mean, they have meditations, vipassana meditation, that meditation, this meditation, laughing meditation, crying meditation, jumping meditation. You get a lot of, I mean, there are so many packages available. Don't think that if there is anything of that sort in uh, the ancient Indian tradition, no, there's nothing of that sort. Hand clapping, uh, I mean, meditation, you get a lot of interesting things. But the idea that Iyengar got, I mean, that's the most interesting thing. That comes from another person, namely Iyengar's guru or Iyengar's uh, mentor was a person coming from uh, Karnataka. He was in the palace of uh, the Mysore kings. 
and uh, he has been trying to promote different kind of yoga postures for his kin. That's another story. I mean, this gentleman I mean, tried to present yoga with a totally different uh, idea. His name is Tirumalai Krishnamacharya. Tirumalai Krishnamacharya was uh, a person, who, I mean, he died in 2004 and uh, he was uh, with the Mysore kings and the Mysore kings wanted him to develop new kinds of uh, yogic exercises. And he started developing new kind of yoga exercises. And looking at his background, one can see that he has been getting training from Swedish acrobatic experts. What you know as modern day yoga, which is presented by Bellur, Krishnamachar, Sundaracharya, Ayyangar, was basically Swedish acrobatics. And he gave new beautiful names for all these yogas, different postures and invented a lot of different postures based on these Swedish exercises. All different postures, he gave a Sanskrit name. And he was, that was his job, to promote his branch of uh, I mean, yoga for his king. So he was once considered one amongst the 100 most influential people by the Time magazine because he was influencing a lot of people, because he was influential to the people who looked to Orient. That was, and he was even given a Patma Sri in 1991. So Patma Sri is one of the uh, civil awards that the government gives to, uh, I mean, people who do something in excellence. BKS Iyengar, who later took it to Europe all around, was a student was a disciple of this uh, Krishnamacharya. That is how the modern postures became popular and became part of the modern understanding about yoga. And what you see in schools now, that's where I began, where children studying all different postures or, or going backwards and I mean getting as a circle or I mean or rolling like a, a wheel, all these kind of things have nothing to do with the ancient idea of yoga. These are Swedish acrobatics presented by Thirumal, Thirumalai Krishnamacharya for his Mysore king, which was taken by his disciple because Iyengar and taken all around Europe. And then from Europe, again, this came back to India and got popular. And that is what we, most of these yogic postures that we know are the Iyengar postures or Iyengar asanas, as one would say. Well, nothing against that. I'm not against any kind of a Swedish acrobat acrobatics if students study and they want to call it a yoga posture. I mean, culture is exchange. You give ideas from, from somewhere and you take ideas from other people and it get new brands and everything. That's all possible. That's how cultures, you know, exchange each other and you get new ideas. Well, well, that's a good exercise. That's a stretching exercise. Not enough good for people who should have aerobic exercises to burn their calories, to pump their uh, I mean, heart. For that, you need frisk walking, running, or aerobic exercises. And these yoga postures do not help you. But still, it will help you for those people who do not do anything. If you have two options, you don't do anything, like in the original idea of yoga, detaching you from all action. That was the original idea of yoga in the beginning sitting in a different special posture and detaching you from any kind of action for a long time. So here they are trying to stretch your body. It's a kind of exercise, light exercise, but sometimes harsh also when it is more acrobatic in nature, but still it doesn't pump you, pump your blood, blood vessels, but still it's an exercise which many people would need flexibility. The junctions are frozen for many people. And if you do all these flexibility exercises, it may be very good for them. Nothing against that. Any kind of exercise is good than sitting idle. Don't go for the original, original yoga idea of detaching from all action. People need a lot of action now. And if somebody wants to do yoga to have an exercise, well, go ahead with that. Nothing against that. And if you want to do some real good exercise, flexibility exercise and you mean stretching exercises as well as aerobic exercises, go for both. 
anybody in the modern times who would take care of his own health should do physical exercises. And people who do not do anything, and if they want to go for yoga, that's good. In a way, this yoga day promoted an idea of doing some kind of an exercises, some kind of little stretching. So that's better than nothing. The idea of body movement is there. But the moment you say that it's magic, it's going to protect you, it's going to elevate you spiritually, it's purely humbug, nothing more than that. And we have to realize it. Coming with very clear position, I would like to say that yoga is something you can do. Yoga postures are nothing bad. And if you want to do some stretching exercise, go for yoga. But don't expect that it's going to give you immunity. Don't expect that it's going to elevate you spiritually. There is no, no way that you can get elevated spiritually because there is nothing that is in a, in a you that separates you from material life and spirituality or nothing like that. These all are ideas that people have. But sitting in calm also is sometimes good. The best thing is sleeping. <laughs> the, another best way is relaxing. Well, if you want to do some meditation instead, you can go for that, but don't overdo any of this. Because the active life is more important. What you do is more important. What you think is more important. What you study is more important. How you move your body is more important than all these exercises. So go ahead with whatever you want, but do some exercises. But don't expect that this will help you from everything. This is not a protection shield from anything. It has its value. Understand it correctly and do it. But there are some people who are against it. Now we have been coming to the original point which should be wanted to ask me. The point that should be wanted to ask me was the attack on the yoga practitioners in Maldives. Well, that's a very fanatic idea, I would say that. If somebody practices yoga and some other people simply would feel that, well, it's against my faith, uh, it's not part of Islam, hmm, no, 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 I don't allow it. I would go and beat these people. That's what they, they did there in Maldives. Some 150 fanatic people went to a yoga performing place on the yoga day and started beating down people, claiming that this is anti-Islam. That's absurd. I mean, it has nothing to do with Islam against a four. It's a simple way of exercising, which India identifies itself because it's part of a tradition. Don't get crazy on unnecessary things. Imagine if it's uh, not, it's not if, even if it's a practice that is against the faith of Islam. Nobody is forcing them to do any yoga. People have their right to practice whatever they want without affecting the freedom and life of other people. If somebody wants to practice yoga, how on earth some other people should feel like that they should stop it? Come on, that's intolerance, absolute intolerance. You cannot do that. I'm an atheist, but I would say that every single person has the right to believe whatever he wants to believe and practice any kind of faith that they think right. And that should be protected in a civilized world. And that should be respected in a civilized world. Respected in the sense that that should be allowed to be performed the way they want it. But those people who find it absurd, meaningless, should have the right to say that, come on, this is absurd. Also, one should have tolerance to that kind of criticism. That's how a civilized society would go forward. You have the freedom to do without any hindrance. You have to practice whatever you want without any hindrance. All the same, others have the right to say that, come on, my faith is right, your faith is wrong. When a Muslim say that Allah is the only God and no other God is a God, that's kind of rejecting all other faith and sticking to one position. Well, he can say that. Some other people can say that, no, our God is the correct God, that Jehovah and all other gods are bad gods. One can say that. Some other people can say that there is no God like this. Some other people can say that the universe is the God. I mean, some, somebody can find a deity as a God. It's all people's freedom. Well, being an atheist, being a rationalist, I would respect the right of other people to believe in anything. Any kind of absurd belief. They have the right to believe, but I would feel, I would, I would understand that that's dangerous. So I would like them to go for reality instead of living in the magical world. 
I would try to tell them. I would write. I would advocate. They can accept it. They can reject it. Everybody, that's a free marketplace of ideas. And I would like to have my freedom, my, my right to tell people that this is absurd. Come on, come to reality. Come to the real world. That's the same feeling that others also should have to different faith. Then only a tolerant world would emerge. Don't have intolerance to others' faiths. If it's not uncivilized, let people do whatever they want. If somebody is doing yoga, it's his or her freedom, and don't try to stop that. That's not a civilized behavior. And people should study that others have the equal right to practice whatever they think right. Like these people who protested try to see that they have a right to believe in what they want. You have to live and let live. And that's the key of the whole thing. You should allow people, you, have, you can have any kind of faith, but others have the right to reject that faith or can have some other faith. But again, coming to yoga, yoga is not a religious thing. It has, to, it has nothing to do with religion. It's just a way, as it was originally mentioned by Patanjali, it's a way to detach you from action, free from activities and get on to yourself, sitting in a posture. The modern day yoga is nothing to do with Patanjali yoga. That is uh, the Iyengar form of Hatha yoga, which is practically acrobatics, coming from Swedish origin. And that is practice as yoga. Well, still one can do it. One can still, some people would say that Hatha yoga is not correct. And the original Patanjali yoga is correct. We, they can discuss and they can do whatever they want. But don't have any wrong idea that yoga would protect you from all kinds of ailments, that yoga would protect you from pandemic, that yoga would protect you from any kind of infection. No, no, no. Don't believe that. There is no evidence that proves that yoga has any kind of protective power, any kind of health benefits than the benefits from exercise. Of course, when exercises have benefits, even stretching exercises have benefits. But beyond that, it has nothing to do with uh, our health system. Body movement helps, and any kind of process would help. The stretching would be good, but concentrate also on aerobic exercises, which is very important. Don't go for the magic claims of all these people or fraudulent claims of any people. It's not charlatans who should decide what is good and bad, but modern science that should decide what is good and bad. Let people, if anybody wants to go for yoga, let them go for yoga. That's better than doing nothing. Let them do some light exercises or some stretching exercises. But those who understand things better, let them do some other kind of exercises. Don't force anything. Let people do whatever they want. That's the way we should see things. But don't get carried away with the big claims that the proponents of yoga would advocate. No, it won't protect you from any kind of ailment. It won't immunize you. It doesn't give you any kind of magical powers. It's just a good stretching exercises, sometimes bad for people with bad back and bad neck. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sanal, sir. And uh, now on this note, let's move forward to the question answer round. Uh, click on the hand raise tool icon as always for asking and please be precise with your questions. Uh, we have a clubhouse linked as well as mentioned earlier. So we'll take our questions from both the platforms. On Clubhouse, we have Kunjama. If you can unmute yourself and proceed. Uh, okay, good evening. Thanks for this opportunity. Like every session, Mr. Sanal Sars talked very well on yoga. Um, I don't believe like uh, uh, Sir suggested that this is not a religious ritual. It is not. It's just an exercise. And you can get injured also with this uh, this kind of postures. 
uh, in India, I mean, not only in India, United States also, including the city of Houston and other major cities, there are yoga centers. People do go to uh, do exercises like that. But I, I don't go anything that sort of centers. I, I go, what do I go, I go to YMCA. YMCA also, there is a, uh, an hour session of uh, yoga uh, um, class, but I don't do, uh, I don't attend that either. I attend other classes like aerobic exercise, dance exercises, things like that. So since we all can be proud that India has uh, their own uh, yoga uh, exercise, which is very nice. Other than that, uh, it is just exercise like any other exercise, existing exercise. But everybody want, everyone need a, an exercise program, uh, especially, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, middle-aged people, uh, all, all kind of people need exercises. If you do any kind of exercises, like 20 minutes uh, per day, uh, or, or, or four to five days a week, that's good enough, which promotes good health. Uh, other than that, there is nothing more I'd like to share. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that note. Uh, I mean, I would suggest that uh, that's the key of the whole thing that Mrs. Matthews has been uh, speaking. Do some exercise, but if you don't want to go for, I mean, hard exercises, go for something light, go for walking, go for brisk walking. And if you want to go for some yoga exercises, also you can, it's a light exercise, you can do that. But don't expect too much about that. I can tell my own personal experience. You know, I've been dancing all my childhood. So many years I've been dancing. So I've been very, very thin person as a young person. And eventually when I stop dancing, that has an impact. Any dancer should understand that if you don't do physical movement after hectic, active childhood, you get obese. And I became very, very fat. I had 105 kilograms weight some, I um, mean, 13, 14 years back or 15 years back. And I've been reducing over the years from 105 kilograms. I could reduce my weight to 70 kilograms now over systematic exercise and food control. And that's possible for anybody. So this example, I would say, because uh, exercising would help. It would make you fit and trim. But you have to really, really do exercises. And with, uh, I mean, light exercises, it won't work. You have to go for brisk walking. You have to cut down your carbos and, uh, I mean, consult a, a dietitian who would speak on the basis of your health. There is no magic solution for everything. No yoga is a magic solution. It's not even a solution for your health issues, but consult a dietitian, consult a physician. And before doing any kind of exercises after a certain age, you need some kind of an orthopedic expert also. Thank you very much. Uh, one more person, uh, that is Proud. Proud. Uh, hello, Proud, you can, uh, you can ask. Uh, for the spread of yoga, uh, now uh, everyone is trying to paint yoga sector. But my uh, humble opinion is, yoga is just a, what you are mentioning as yoga is Hada Yoga. Hada yoga is just a jumping stone to Raja yoga. Without Hada yoga, Raja yoga cannot be achieved. And Raja yoga is the ultimate experience of religion. So yoga has its roots in religion. Separating yoga from religion is can be good for marketing, but reality stands apart. Uh, thank you. Well, I mean, that's one way of seeing it. I don't know which religious text whether it is Vedas, I mean, uh, any kind of ancient Indian text would advise to attain the, the bliss or uh, nirvana or the height of moksha or, or uh, stopping the uh, you know, eternal cycle of rebirth, you have to do yoga. That's why in, in Buddhist tradition, it doesn't say like that. In Jainist tradition, it doesn't say like that. In Sramanika tradition, it doesn't say like that. In uh, Vedas, it doesn't say like that. So uh, some people would say that 
Raja Yoga is what you have to achieve. Who said that? Raja Yoga is the highest thing that after one has to achieve. I would say that wisdom is the highest thing that one would achieve and health is the best thing that you have to achieve on your physical body. These are different perspectives. You can say that, uh, I mean, getting Nirvana is the highest form of achievement that one, one wants to achieve. It's all subjective perspectives. And what is Raja Yoga is also something esoteric. And that is the highest form of achievement is a kind of position which Vivekananda would interpret the Patanjali Yoga. So, who, I mean, there are many schools in, the, in modern day Hinduism which would reject Vivekananda's ideas. Vivekananda himself has denounced, for example, the importance of Vedas that was given by the Adi Samadhis. Hinduism is not one school and Raja Yoga is not considered by all Hindus or any kind of classic Hindu text as the highest achievement of the faith. Well, one can believe that, but uh, I'm not interested in becoming a Raja Yogi. I'm interested in becoming just me and good health and good uh, wisdom and good knowledge is what is at highest achievement for me. For you, it may be Raja Yoga. For me, it could be a comfortable health and a comfortable base of uh, knowledge. And I am, my faculties work very well. That is more important for me. So it depends on people to people. Somebody can say Nirvana is what I want to achieve. Somebody can say that I want to stop the cycle of rebirth. That's my ultimate goal. It's all based on one's belief. One can say what is his or her goal. But why yoga, for example, all these people who are now asked to do yoga are not asked to become Raja Yogis. That's the goal. If somebody wants to say that is a religious content. But in schools, when it is presented, it's not presented as you have to all achieve Raja Yoga, as Vivekananda said or Patanjali said. So it's presented as an exercise mainly. Well, I don't say that it's secular, but it's non-religious in its origin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prav. Uh, next one, Saju. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sorry, I joined very late because I was in that uh, room. I could not come here. Uh, I listened only to the later part of your presentation. Uh, I uh, personally, I got into uh, yoga because of uh, a back uh, problem, and uh, my orthopedician actually suggested me to do yoga. And since then, uh, I, I have immensely benefited from, uh, from uh, doing yoga. So I don't do it regularly, but still, uh, that is my fallback or backup. Uh, uh, thing to go to if I uh, start having some back problem even now. Uh, the question, uh, uh, and also then after that I got, I read uh, the Padanjali Yoga Sutras and I agree with you that it is uh, uh, really uh, secular. Uh, I don't find any religion in that. Uh, my question to you is, uh, I don't know whether you covered this already. Uh, in, in, even in Clubhouse, I find there is a, a fear uh, especially among, I think, liberal-minded uh, people, that if you promote uh, yoga, it may sneak in uh, right-wing uh, politics. Uh, sometimes I feel that if uh, yoga was uh, uh, recommended by Zizek or um, Chomsky, uh, they would have accepted that. Uh, I, and they try to find some uh, case reports of some injuries uh, reported, uh, which I think uh, could be even uh, the case for any sports uh, and uh, try to frighten people uh, from uh, doing yoga. Uh, do you have any take on this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. In fact, I mean, some people who have certain political positions want to identify anything that see, they see around as, uh, you know, it's like a don't kick swords uh, all around. I mean, the monster is all around there or, or you have... Uh, the, the windmill there, but you can see that as a monster. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a feeling that some people try to promote uh, all around because everything is dangerous for them. Anything that their political opponent would say would be promoting their political ideology. See, for example, one, one good example I can tell you, when it was Narendra Modi who has gone to the United Nations and asked for a yoga day. Well, then those, those people who oppose him politically would say, well, that's a right-wing ideology. Then what about Jawaharlal Nehru? Nehru was not considered as a, as a person with the same political ideology of Narendra Modi. He is considered to be something like an icon for the secularists. 
but he was practicing yoga and not only practicing, but promoting yoga. So how would you consider that as a politically right-wing ideology that yoga is? Come on, that's too much that these people try to present. That's not how things are to be seen. I'm not an advocate of yoga. I would say that yoga is good for stretching exercises. And uh, well, I mean, I would, what I need is not stretching exercises, but I need these aerobic exercises. And I do that. I mean, if anybody wants to do more flexibility with their body, and if they do it uh, with that, I mean, it's good for them. But don't think that, I mean, it will end up your, for example, your orthopedic problems. You have to consult an orthopedician for that. One example I've been mentioning in the beginning of this meeting was the story of Mati Antila coming from Europe, uh, who, whom I know personally. He's a very famous photographer. He has gone to India and sat in a lotus position to, he thought, I mean, he didn't want any kind of exercises. He wanted to attain nirvana. That is what he was seeking. And he sat in a lotus position, the Patmasan for a long time, in a cave in Sri Lanka, in Kandy. And nearly an year, most of the time he sat in that position, except when he was sleeping or when he was going out to the market to buy something. But what happened was a terrible disc problem. After one year, he could not walk. At the age of 23, he was crippling. And he went and met a doctor in India because he was on a great oriental trip. And he said, you have done something wrong because this is not a natural position. When you fix your body on an unnatural position where body is not actually meant to be like that, for some time you can do it for stretching. But if you do it regularly for a long time, it can cause some problem. So what he did was, one can sit on Patmasan. I mean, even I can do Patmasan very easily. Uh, but uh, if you do it regularly every day for longer hours, then your bottom of your I mean, spine has some pressure which, you can, which can create some problem. Also, it is, I mean, the New York Times article, which they periodically reproduce, say that, I mean, well, you can do exercises, I mean, without problem. But if you have cervical spondylosis, it's not very good. And if you have neck crisis, don't go for sirshasana and all these kind of things. That's why if you haven't been doing yoga from the childhood, and if you are doing new postures or asanas, consult an orthopedic expert, your orthopedician, then only you do that. And also, it doesn't, for example, help you from protection from any other thing. What I would say is that it's nothing to do with religion. It's a light exercise, stretching exercise. Come on, we need not be afraid of everything around. All the monsters around with right-wing politics coming and are going to eat us. I mean, that's a kind of, a, I mean, it's a kind of paranoia. You need not go for that. It has nothing to do with the right-wing politics. Or, I mean, if you call what, what is, for example, it's the present day government is presented as right wing politics, which is also doubtful. For example, where is one, what is right wing and what is left wing on the economic policies or the social policies or the cultural policies? That's a serious issue to be dealt with. One has to address issues independently without calling right or left, but on the merit of each issue. And Calling names and branding people, making the classic division and the eternal division of two classes of people, these kind of things would force you to find an enemy everywhere waiting for you with their I mean, secret weapons. So that is not uh, closer to reality. Therefore, one need not be afraid of everything coming as a political uh, I mean, weapon against you is... I mean, that's, that's not reality. That's, uh, that's a kind of a paranoia. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam, sir. Can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, uh, Please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other aspect is uh, the commercialization of uh, um, the yoga. Uh, you can see uh, everywhere these yoga studios and uh, each uh, uh, the so-called gurus are coming up with their own versions of uh, yoga. Uh, so, is this a healthy uh, trend? Uh, <laughs> Who are we to decide what is healthy and what is not unhealthy? It's a free marketplace of ideas. And, uh, you know, market is an open phenomenon. The ancient yoga did not sell well in the world. The, the Krishnamachari version, which was taken by Iyengar, is selling well in the world. I mean, the Iyengar Hatha Yoga is what is selling in the world. Uh, if some people would say that that's not actually the yoga, well, I mean, that has no market elsewhere in the world. 
Iyengar yoga has a lot of market because it's a kind of feel good atmosphere but not only if you go to this any of these yoga studios i have visited one and i know it also the kind of atmosphere is what what is what they are selling that's what people want you know they want some kind of special experience they get an indian chai with the cardamom they have all these agarbattis burning there then they they have all these fine designed uh, indian paintings there so it's an atmosphere that's created along with that you have some yoga there is no mantra but only yoga so it's a kind of light uh, exercise presented in an oriental atmosphere and that's how people market things the the what, what you know everything when it is marketed to make it successful you have to add value to it how you how are you adding value to your uh, <laughs> yoga shop or yoga studio the cardamom tea the agarbatti or the the light indian uh, classical music on the backdrop it all makes a kind of a value added feeling and what is what is the money that we spend for things people spend money for the experience they want something special they don't want to go and have a flight to india but want to have a piece of india which they think what is india and they get it and if it's a light exercise that they get it's fine i'm not against marketing per se you can market anything provided it's not damaging other people and the you pay money because you feel the value of it and the value added is the cleverness or the marketing capacity of the seller any product that you buy, buy in the market has many techniques to feel that the value is added to it so what is against marketing marketing is an important thing that keeps the wheel rolling in the world I hope your question is answered. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. Do we have any question, questions, Madhu? Do we have any questions? There is an echo coming somewhere. Okay. From, yeah. No. Yep. seems we are done with the questions now okay so i believe that we are done with the questions uh, thank you madhu and thank you sanam sir for uh, uh, enlightening us with this knowledge and uh, thank you everybody for participating and hopefully we see you next week again so thank you everybody thank you very much thank you uh, i mean baba madhu uh, and shubhi especially who has been anchoring all my programs all these years Thank you very much. Thank you.